member of the uh, New Orleans Jazz Orchestra and later as the first development officer with the New Orleans Jazz and Heritage Foundation. And now I have been given the directorship of a seven campus, uh, a seven uh, historic building uh, campus uh, in the middle of Treme, uh, African American Museum, that we are in the process right now of restoring all the buildings to their 1840 splendor uh, and creating a Creole community as it would have looked in the heyday of Treme. Now, uh, how, ma how many of you uh, have, um, have been to Treme? I see a couple of you have been to the museum. How many of you have been to Treme before? Okay. Where, where were you? Where, where did you go when you went to Treme? I worked for a short time at the um, Clark High School. Yes. The tutoring kids. Oh, great. You? Uh -huh. um, well, my um, my daughter is roommates with a um, with a jazz vocalist, and she performs in the Marini and down there. So she's always taking um, little tours. I've actually been to the museum because one of my other daughter's friend's mother worked there for a while. Oh, great! At the African American Museum when, uh -huh. she, when it first started a long time ago. Someone on this side. Um. Mm -hmm. uh, visiting friends, and mm -hmm. also I have a, a long association with the mother-in-law lounge. Ah. And I spent a lot of time with Ernie Cato and Antoinette Cato, now their daughter, Betty Fox. Very nice. And I'm um, actively trying to say that. <laughs> <laughs> and you? Uh, I play shows at the mother-in-law lounge, actually. Uh -huh. and, um, my friend lives there, and I always go there to see the Indians. Fantastic. Well, you all mentioned uh, several of the places that make that uh, neighborhood so unique. Uh, as uh, those of you who have looked at some of the material uh, I've passed out uh, will know, uh, Treme is the oldest uh, African-American uh, neighborhood in America, continuously settled African-American neighborhood in America. Our museum is on the site of the first brickyard in the city uh, that was established by the Company of the Indies uh, in 1725. If you do the math, it's only six years or so after the first settlement uh, of New Orleans in the French Quarter. So many of the bricks that uh, were fired to form uh, the uh, first buildings in the city were fired right there on the site of our museum. From uh, your brochure, you see that our main building of the seven is uh, a magnificent uh, Creole Villa. It's the largest Creole Villa left standing in the city. Uh, it was built though, in 1828. And uh, this was uh, about, uh, you know, 16 years uh, after, 17 years after the um, annexation of uh, Treme into the city of New Orleans as a third uh, Farberg. So if you do the math, that means that right now we are upon the uh, 200th anniversary of the bicentennial of the founding of Treme, which uh, brings me to the question that I want to pose uh, to you all today. Now we, uh, uh, we have an um, African-American museum in the city. It is the only uh, uh, museum in the city that is dedicated to preserving and interpreting the African-American culture, uh, uh, art, and history of the city. Uh, so the first question I want to ask you all is, uh, does a city like New Orleans need a dedicated museum, an African-American museum? Does anybody think that we don't need a museum that's dedicated just to uh, African American culture and history? Whew, that's good. At least I might <laughs> still have a job after this. Huh? <laughs> why? Why does anybody think we need uh, such a museum? Anybody? Yes, ma'am. Uh, more than any other American city, we had a very large population of black people. And not only did they just live in one place in the city, they were involved in many aspects of the whole history of the city. Great. Uh, absolutely correct. As a matter of fact, uh, New Orleans had the largest and uh, certainly the most sophisticated uh, uh, population of people of color in uh, antebellum times uh, in America. 
You know, um, I tell you, I was from the East Coast. I have a ton of relatives who live in Baltimore. And uh, I slipped a couple of times uh, when talking to them and said that, you know, we had the largest population of free people uh, in America. And I have a cousin who is way too smart. And uh, he said, oh, that's not true. You know, Baltimore had a larger population, like in the census of 1840, than New Orleans of people of color. But I said, yes, but ours were certainly a lot more sophisticated. It was a lot more fun to live here than in Baltimore. Uh, and in fact, this leads me to the question that I want to ask you all today. And that is that um, as we approach the, uh, uh, the bicentennial of the statehood of Louisiana, uh, who here knows when Louisiana was, became a state? 1812. So we're like a year and a half out from that. All right, this guy sitting in the front of the class, that's good. Uh, so uh, uh, as the, uh, uh, you know, the African American Museum of Record, the question for us is what do we do to commemorate this bicentennial? Now it just so happens that uh, Louisiana became a state and Treme became an official part of the city right about at the same time. Uh, the uh, land area that is now Treme, which really extends from uh, Rampart Street, you know, can, uh, Canal, uh, and Esplanade, all the way up to Bayou St. John originally. Um, that uh, land was, uh, was, before it became uh, a, a Farberg or a suburb of the city, it was part of uh, a plantation, a Treme uh, plantation, and the city began buying the property in 1810. And uh, by 1812, they had pretty much parceled it out into uh, parcels that they sold uh, to people. Uh, and so by 1812, when Louisiana became a state, uh, Treme was a fully subdivided section of the city. So the question is, what should we do to commemorate um, the uh, statehood of Louisiana, bicentennial of the statehood of Louisiana, and uh, the corresponding uh, bicentennial of the founding of our neighborhood? Which I'll also uh, posit to you uh, to echo your sentiment, uh, but to carry it a little bit further. I think that uh, you know, Treme and New Orleans is probably uh, the most influential African-American neighborhood in America in terms of its contributions to many things, um, culture, uh, art, uh, politics, and race uh, in America. No other single place in America has such interesting narratives that have had such a profound influence on not just our own local uh, area, but the, and not just in America, but throughout the world. So we know that there are a lot of firsts that happened in Treme. Um, the, um, I guess the seminal uh, thing that makes us so different and so unique was uh, the, establishment of Congo Square uh, in 1817, where uh, by proclamation of the city, African slaves were allowed to uh, dance and uh, to have, uh, m uh, you know, markets and perform their own rituals on Sundays. Uh, and, uh, you know, white people were not allowed to go into Congo Square at that time. They had like armed guards there. Uh, they wouldn't allow white people to go in. And they also wouldn't allow uh, Creole people of color to go in there either. With the exception of one uh, 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 person of color who uh, was notorious in her um, ability to go in. And who do you think that might be? Maria Laveau, they say that she put a spell on the uh, guards and would walk in with her big snake and uh, put, take of all the dances and things like that. Uh, so that is a very seminal place. And I know that you all have probably discussed that here. But there are a lot of other first two. Um, you know, in Treme uh, is the site of the very first uh, publication of an anthology of poetry by people of color. It's called Les Sonnelles. Uh, in 1845, 
uh, uh, it's uh, the first publication ever by people of color of an anthology of poetry. Also, um, is the uh, site of the first uh, African American or uh, uh, regular newspaper by people of color. Uh, it certainly has its uh, place in uh, the um, you know, struggle for human and civil rights, uh, in part uh, because of a kind of, of three-way caste system that uh, evolved in uh, New Orleans, where you had uh, white people who were, you know, various ethnicities who were full citizens uh, throughout uh, the um, the, uh, the control of uh, the, both the colonies uh, of, uh, when there were colonies of Spain and France, and also uh, when we became an American colony and later a state. And then you had the African or black population that, uh, you know, started out as slaves and had uh, no rights, and, um, and then through uh, Reconstruction had uh, a little taste of rights and then Jim Crow up until the present. And then you had a huge population of people in the middle who were of mixed race, uh, Creoles of people of color. And they formed a very big proportion of the population of New Orleans from the very beginning. Uh, and uh, it is uh, the um, the issue or the issues, some of the issues that uh, correspond with uh, free people of color that I want to talk about today. We'll leave some of the other issues uh, uh, for uh, other discussions. But what do we know about these people? Um, they're, um, uh, I guess the, uh, the, the big influx of people, uh, free people of color came after the Haitian Revolution here in uh, they. Uh, first, uh, between the years of 1803 and 1809, you had a tremendous influx of, of people. Originally, they came from uh, Haiti uh, via Cuba, where they had uh, fled to escape uh, the consequences of the Haitian Revolution. And then, as, uh, you know, uh, conflict between Spain and France got a a little um, more intense. Uh, they were forced out of Cuba and uh, between 1809 and 1811, the population of people of color in New Orleans like doubled. Uh, you know, you had three times more free people of color and twice as many slaves who came to New Orleans. Now, these people fashioned them, they were, um, you know, these people had a, a, a status that was right there in the middle. Uh, and they were, for the most part, of mixed heritage, mixed race, either European and African, uh, of, uh, you know, French or Spanish background or uh, any other, after they got here, of uh, any of the other immigrants that came here, Germans. Uh, and so forth. But uh, do you think it was to their advantage to uh, create this kind of, or to maintain this kind of tripartite status here? Um, or do you think that the, um, you know, the rest of the country uh, had pretty much started uh, with the, uh, you know, the uh, the American influence on the rest of the country had pretty much uh, created this um, divisions, uh, social divisions based on race that were pretty much black and white. So uh, can someone tell me what would be the advantages to people of color of having a caste right in between? At the time, um, free people of color were able to own property and even vote, the men could vote. Um, and and women could own property too. And, and women could own property as well. Mm -hmm. But and then after the Americans came in and uh, the war, those uh, those rights were actually, you know, those people, the Creole people, and people, free people of color, were really actually in a war, uh, were in a worse position. Yeah, because they were in kind of a limbo. What kind of property did they own? 
Um, they own their own houses, and a lot in the Treme area you're talking about, from what I know. And, um, they also uh, have interesting a fact about that, if you look at the records, uh, women own the yes. majority yes. of the free women, Creole women of color, own mo uh, most of the property in mm -hmm. Treme. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's only in Louisiana that, that was allowed that. What other, and so they, they were able to uh, trade in uh, real estate. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, what other things could they own? Businesses. Mm -hmm. Yes, they own businesses. I mean, they had their and own what type of business? whole community of, of everything. You, you rarely ventured out of the community in which you lived to do your business. They had butchers and um, cobblers or whatever, you know, right. uh, uh, leather workers. They had everything within their own area. And um, ironically, I find that to this day, there is a distinct differentiation of people who think they are Creole. Yes. <laughs> they are very, very, very definitively Creole. That's right. That's, That's why I don't call them African Americans uh, in this conversation <laughs> yet, because they haven't gotten to be African Americans yet or by their own self. But the, uh, the businesses that they own were very, uh, I mean, it was very unique because the Creoles were the artisans of New Orleans. I mean, almost all of the building arts were populated by Creoles. Uh, the iron workers, the brick masons, the plasterers, especially like plaster. Remember I was telling you that I told you that the, uh, uh, the site that we were on was the first brickyard. Well, the bricks that were first fired there were what we now call soft red bricks. Uh, because uh, they were um, uh, they were fired from clay that came from up the river, and what do we know about anything that comes this far down the river? Very silty, very fine, and it could not be fired too hot. So um, you know, because of technology limitations and because of the raw materials they were using, these bricks were not suitable to be external bricks. So that's why the initial uh, buildings uh, in the city for you know almost a, a century had to be covered in plaster uh, you know so you'll notice that some of the older buildings the bigger older churches in uh, the uh, the quarter the Marigny and you know Tremaine older neighborhoods are all kind of brick buildings that are covered in plaster and it wasn't until like the 1830s that they found clay on the North Shore that was more, uh, that was, that they could fire ho uh, hotter and harder. And uh, that's why you see uh, across Canal Street, a lot of the churches and uh, big mansions and so forth and houses have external bricks. But the Creoles and the uh, free people of color were the craftspeople. They did everything. They were painters. They were, um, you know, uh, they were great chefs. They were seamstresses. They did all of these things. Now, um, so uh, I'm in a neighborhood that was very much populated by uh, Creoles of color. And, uh, uh, and so uh, we have a lot of myths about uh, uh, race and history uh, in this country. And we have a lot of mystiques that about New Orleans that uh, make for very colorful narratives. But sometimes uh, the truth or the reality is much more jarring than um, fiction. And that may be the case with uh, the history of Treme. For instance, uh, none of you mentioned the thing that really uh, uh, separated this class of people from people of color almost everywhere else. Uh, that they owned. And what do you think that is? Someone else. They owned slaves. And uh, that gave them a, you know, a kind of a, um, a uh, privileged position uh, as long as they could maintain that triple, that, that kind of middle status. So, um, when we uh, approach, uh, you know, in a museum, we're in the business of, of not only preserving uh, 
history through objects, but also presenting them. So when we present these stories and present these narratives as colorful as they are, oftentimes there are some sides of this that, uh, that you know, are kind of difficult for people to deal with. Now, um, how many people here have uh, thought about how complicated it is to tell a story of people of color owning other people of color. I mean, so how do we do that? And that's what I want you all to help me, uh, uh, help me with today. We have some ideas, and I want to try some of them out on you all. So in Louisiana, um, race was a very, very, very important thing. Uh, your, your race was determined by the amount of African blood that you had. And you, if you swear the kind of the one drop rule prevailed, uh, if you were like our president and half of your family was black and the other half was white, you would be called what? Black. Yes, and specifically in Louisiana, we had names for these people. You'd be a mulatto, right. So if our president had married a person who all of her family was white, so he had an African father and a white mother, and then if he married someone who both of her parents were white, uh, so you have one line African, three lines white, what would, he, what would his kids, what would uh, Malia be called? A quadroon. So now if Malia married a white person, so now in that line we only have one line of Africans, and now you have seven lines of, of uh, whites, it, what would her child be called? Octoroon. And by this time now you're like, what, 30, 40, 60 years or something like that? You still, and they would look pretty much like most of you all here, but in Louisiana, that still would not make you white. So, uh, you know, you had to have like, uh, even if you had like one thirty second, that is like only if the president's father and his family were African and no one else for like 120 years in his family had any African blood in him, he still would be considered black in Louisiana by law, because like one thirty second. So it's a very complicated story here. So we had a lot of people coming in and out of uh, Louisiana who, um, you know, may have concealed some of their past. Um, uh, most famously, um, uh, John James Audubon. Everybody know who he is? And uh, do you know that his mother was a person of color, a mulatto? So in Louisiana, if while he was here, he could have been, uh, you know, viewed as a, a, a free person of color if he had not passed. So how do we, first of all, how do we name people like this? You know, most of the, um, most of the most uh, uh, well-established uh, families, as you said, uh, here of, uh, of what are now African-American families here were started out as free people of color here in Treme and later in the Seventh Ward, and actually started out in the lower half of the French Quarter in the Seventh Ward. And uh, for much of the 19th century, they were, uh, certainly in antebellum time, they would be listed as a free man of color, FMC, you would see that after uh, their name. So um, what do you call them in 2012? <laughs> New Orleanians. So to you, would that mean that, uh, well, explain, explain what you mean by that. Well, I mean, we're such a culturally diverse city, and it's so easily um, acceptable in New Orleans to grow up as a child or person of mixed races. I mean, my kids are mixed. My husband's Creole. He would definitely argue down he's Creole. My kids are mixed. They grew up and I think they were probably in third and fourth grade before they realized that there was something different about them than most people. So it's it's a I mean, you know, it's a it's a wonderful city to be from mm -hmm. if you're gonna be something besides lily white or absolutely black. So mm -hmm. well I think that, that uh, I think that, that very fact 
that uh, it is uh, such a place that if you are in this kind of third group here that we might be able to create some narratives that could be instructive because uh, race is still a very important component in the way this country operates. And I just think that uh, New Orleans, uh, Treme uh, even in particular, it has the greatest opportunity of any neighborhood in America to explore a dialogue uh, about race. Now, uh, we had an event a few years ago uh, that the politicians promised us would, uh, you know, open up this, you know, this can of worms that, that we all take pride in sometimes when we're talking about culture, but we don't always want to discuss some of the dark sides of it. And that was the um, uh, aftermath of Hurricane Katrina. How many, is anybody here uh, satisfied that the promise that that singular event or the aftermath of that event, uh, that it actually did open up any meaningful dialogue on race? I mean, does anybody think that it did? Does anybody think that a dialogue on race really is necessary? Oh, yeah. You think so? Mm -hmm. I mean, you said you thought a museum uh, on African American history is necessary. So you think that we are the place that, that could do something like that? Mm -hmm. So how far do we go? So the, do we start publicizing the fact that some people are not as white or as black as they <laughs> <laughs> want to be? Start outing people? I mean, good. <laughs> hmm? what do you think? Maybe so. We could do that. Sure, absolutely. I mean, how would we do that? Maybe Anybody? create a, um, a database where people could actually find information about their history. I mean, a lot of people don't know. Yeah. They don't know what their ethnic mix is other than to say, I'm from here and I look this way. So well, you maybe know, a, a beginning of a database of, of, of a record of people that were originally here and their heritage. Well, the interesting thing is that that is possible here in Louisiana more so than almost anywhere else because of the <coughs> records that were kept by the Spanish and the French and the way uh, they, that that happened because in many other states, uh, the non-white uh, historical records kind of don't exist because they were not necessary. But here, they were as, as par uh, primarily as a result of, of kind of uh, I don't want to say lax, but let's say a less strict uh, 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 relationship that the Spanish had with their slaves and then ultimately with the Catholic Church being so much a, a, a prevalent uh, cultural and political factor when French ruled here. Um, you have records on slaves uh, here in Louisiana that you don't have anywhere else. And we also have uh, some historians who have gone to great lengths to record that. Uh, one, and I don't know if she has appeared for you in any of your class, Gwendolyn Midlow Hall. Are you all familiar with this book, Africans in Louisiana? Yeah. This uh, woman uh, researched uh, every uh, cargo ship of Africans that came to Louisiana from I think uh, 1719 to 1820, so I mean, it's like 106,000 records. So uh, it is possible using, and this is a database that she now has online, uh, it is possible uh, that uh, from after the census started here in, uh, I guess we became a state, 1812, so let's say after the 1820 census, uh, you could go back another 100 years for the Africa component, which you can't do in most other places. You can go back another 100 years and uh, access those records. But we all carry around uh, a database, uh, you know, on our bodies, right? You have DNA testing, you know? I have a staff person who says we need to set up an exhibit that would, you know, uh, of swabs, we should swab everyone's jaws and uh, who wants to submit. And, uh, and uh, you know, and um, create uh, a interactive exhibit whereby people could um, offer themselves for DNA testing. 
and uh, and you know this could be kind of a and then at some point in time we would have to uh, obviously give them the results of that test and in some way get their responses to it uh, what do you all think of something like that what would be the value of something like that And what they had been through. Mm -hmm. Maybe, uh, and maybe some of their families have been through things that they were either not aware of now, or that they suppress now, or that they maybe um, don't hold in high esteem uh, now. Uh, but on the other hand, they may learn things that they don't want to know. Uh, and then what happens? It's hard to put the cat back in the bag. Yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, to paraphrase, um, I think, you know, uh, Louisiana, like a lot of other uh, outposts like this, uh, uh, where you had, uh, you know, we like to talk about this um, gumbo that we have here in Louisiana, but we don't really talk about the implications of it for all people because not all people have been able to take advantage of it. Uh, but. Uh, Let's say that um, we were able to do something like that. Um, uh, we are not an art museum, we're a cultural museum and a history museum. We could certainly do it under our mission, right? Uh, politically, uh, you think it is a smart thing for a museum to do? Uh, you, well, first of all, you think it would be a controversial thing for us to do? I think it would be good. Sir, you were going to say? You were going to speak? No. I said it would be controversial. Definitely. You do? Probably. I mean, it, I mean, I guess if people have the choice, it shouldn't be controversial. But there's probably a lot of loopholes and. Where do you think the controversy stuff? would would be uh, most extreme? Getting, getting, like I guess the contracts, and not only that, it's just not 100 percent accurate either. With, I mean, I guess that's the controversy. As part. Well, also, I mean, look at our uh, look at our visitorship. I mean, we have all kind of visitors. We have foreign visitors. We have young visitors, old visitors. Yes, ma'am. I think it would be more controversial with the rest of America because they would probably say, "Why are you delving into something people don't want to know if their family was slaves?" Yeah. And they would try to be protective of the people who are getting swabbed who are going to find out maybe something that they don't want to know. Mm -hmm. But I think people do want to know right or wrong, you know, things about their family's past. Well, you, and you use the word family. And, uh, and I think that that is where it becomes controversial because you are one person. You are an individual. You can make a decision for yourself, correct? You, you can, right? You're an adult, <laughs> okay? How about making a decision for your family? Would you want to do that? Well, no, because I can't speak for all of them. Well, maybe your DNA can speak for all of them. <laughs> Would you do that? Mm. We had an exhibit at NOMA one time. Uh, photography exhibit. We had uh, Stephen McClance, who was a great uh, photo curator. And um, this exhibition had, uh, it was an exhibit of, of just photographs in our permanent collection. And it had a wide range of photos, a, a lot of subjects. You know, some were, you know, might have been considered racy, you know, some nudes and things like that. But he had one uh, photograph that he had a black uh, it was, you know, it was just regular. You walk down the gallery and walk down the aisles, you see all these photos. One had a black um, uh, piece of cloth, a piece of felt over it. A little sign that said, um, you know, uh, you have the option of picking up that uh, cloth and looking at this photo. But the person who was the subject of the photo had requested that the photo cease to be shown. That person didn't own the photo. The museum owns the photo. The photographer uh, you know, owns kind of the uh, intellectual rights to it. The museum and the photographer own intellectual rights to the photo. 
The museum decided to put the photo on the wall, give you a choice of whether or not you wanted to look at it. And I'll tell you what the photo was. It was a photo from, uh, from uh, Vietnam. Do you remember the photo of, of the napalm girl who had all this stuff and she was running around nude and uh, she was burning, her skin was just burning off? Well, uh, at some point, you know, that photo became, you know, uh, ubiquitous with the uh, anti-war movement. It was just everywhere. But, you know, uh, not a lot of people thought about what it meant to that woman and her family to have her photo going everywhere. So she said, at some point in the interview, she wished that people would stop, you know, viewing that photo. So we place it in the museum. We put a cover over it. What do you think happened? <laughs> what do you think? What does anybody else think? Do you think that uh, a lot of people looked or a lot of people passed it up? How many people by a show of hands thinks that uh, most people looked? How many think that most people passed it up? Wow, y'all are cynical. Nobody here thinks so. <laughs> Why do you think people looked? Curiosity. Do you think it was a moral dilemma for any anybody? Did the placard say that the subject didn't want it? To yes, be absolutely. They actually even told the story. I mm -hmm. think most people even knew about that. And um, well, maybe if you knew what it was, you might not have looked. I mean, you know, if it just said the subject didn't want to be viewed, then it'd say why, and you'd wonder. But no, yeah. that particular photograph. She didn't want that photograph right. viewed. I mean, she. She's a normal person now. She didn't. Uh, she is very much, you know, a public. I guess a public person to an extent. But. So the question is, faced with a moral dilemma in a museum, the majority of the people <laughs> just. I mean, they would pause, but it's almost like you said. It's almost like that decision attracted them, and they went for it. Now. What do you think would happen if we pose this moral, your moral dilemma uh, in the museum? Do you think many people would uh, get a free DNA thing if we gave them an opportunity? Mm -hmm. yes. Do you think they would? Yes. Would you? Yes. Would you? Would you, sir? Nope. You would? Why not? More or less, I would be trusting. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Just what y'all would do with it. Now I, I wouldn't think most people would do it either. You don't think they would? How about you? Sure. You would do it? Mm -hmm. How many people would do it if, if given the chance? Mm -hmm. How many would not? Well, <laughs> there we go. <laughs> <laughs> do you think it's something about a museum when given a choice, a uh, moral choice like that, that uh, people you know, feel more trusting? Because, you know, it really does come down to what you say, I mean. I guess they would feel more trusting for a museum, but still just kind of evasive, kind of coming into, I mean, I don't know if that mean what you would actually do with it, be in a database, but who would be accessing that database? What if I told you I just throw the information away, I'll just give it to you and throw it away? I'm still crying out. You wouldn't believe me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so the real question here is, let's say all of you said that you would make the decision to do it for yourself, but what do you think, are there any of you that think that your families might have a problem with you making that decision? Yeah. Would mm -hmm. Any of you think that your families would have a problem with you making that decision? You do? Yeah. You don't think some of them would want to know? No. I think most of my family would want to know, but I tell you some of my, I mean, I, my sister-in-law told me last week that, that her cousin told her they have a test now and you can find out how black you are with your DNA test and she was right. going to do it. And I said, why? Because they, they're Creole and they think there is something special about whatever percentage you actually have. So they were buying a $59 test offline to find out just how black you are. Right. Because the test really does, well, now the test is a little more <laughs> accurate. They actually can tell you you know, really what ethnicity you're from, you know, Irish, whatever. A lot of people, especially black people, find out they're not as black as they thought they were. <laughs> you know, uh, you know, like Tom Joyner, the guy on the uh, air. I mean, I think that he, uh, like black was the least of all of his, like African was the least of all of his ethnic origins. So uh, 
you know, so how uh, interactive do we go with an issue about race? You know, I haven't talked about it. We haven't been discussed. I've been kind of discussing this, not in a social construct. I mean, we can all talk about the horrors of slavery and um, all that kind of thing. As a matter of fact, the exhibition, if you read the handout, the exhibition that I have uh, on display now is called Drape to Mania. Um, is anybody here familiar with that uh, term? It's a disease. Anybody familiar with drapetomania? Well, let me tell you about it. It is a disease that comes from a root word, a Greek word, uh, mania meaning crazy, mm -hmm. and drapeto meaning runaway slaves. So drapetomania in 1851 was, you know, this is like published in scientific journals, a disease that was discovered to affect only African people in slavery and it made them want to run away. So if you were a slave and wanted to run away, you could be declared mentally ill. And you could be declared crazy to want to run away. Now, how many of you think that uh, that could pass the science right now? No. But it was, um, uh, it was you know, uh, during this whole pseudoscience, they were trying to prove uh, a lot of things, but uh, I guess uh, one of the purposes I think uh, of the pseudoscience is to try to justify the, you know, this build up to the Civil War. And, um, you know, as I said, New Orleans is a place that is uh, very, very, very unique uh, in our discourse about uh, race because that um, disease was discovered in New Orleans. So by Dr. Samuel Cartwright, who was at the time a leading uh, uh, psychologist and physician on the uh, health and illnesses of the, uh, you know, of the Negro race. So we have an exhibit up now that shows like various uh, uh, slaves' reactions to race. I mean, you could, you know, if you caught this disease, you know, I think the symptoms. I mean, it's just it reads just like a you know, a disease with treatment plans. I mean, you know, when you started getting it, uh, you know, you would not want to work as much and you wouldn't remain sufficiently bowed. And, you know, if you saw the person actually look into the face of his overseer or master or mistress, you knew that they had contracted the disease and it was contagious. I mean, uh, it, you know, uh, it was like the plague. They would even, you know, run away. So, and the prescription for that, if you, what do you think a, a doctor would do if, they, if you were uh, diagnosed with this? What do you think the prescription was for a mild case of drape to Yes, sir. Yeah. No, go ahead. No, what do you I, think? I, I, would, I wouldn't know. I mean, I mean, it seems to me like they would try to uh, control like a group of people that would, that would think maybe. But this is a physical disease. You're trying to cure somebody. I guess I can't look at it from that perspective. I mean, I, I still, I still think that I mean, any person in that situation would want to get away from that situation. I mean, it's, it just seems like a common thing that you'd want to do. But I mean, I guess it's now. I don't know. Yeah. Well, back then you'd be considered crazy if you wanted to get away from that situation. What do you think if the doctor wrote your prescription later? It probably gave him some alcohol or narco narcotic to try and you know oh, intoxicate. You're too kind. You must. You <laughs> were you are a psychoanalyst. It, it's probably like what they do with a lot of people that are claimed or are diagnosed as being uh, crazy. They they put them essentially in a mental ward. They imprison them. They were already in prison. They were. Well, did they get even more? I would think they would probably shackle them somewhere. All right. Even before that, that was though if you had a real full-blown case. But <laughs> yes, sir. I guess my guess would be like poison or something, wouldn't it? I mean, I don't know. No, no, no. Probably. Commonplace. Whipping. There you go. The very first line of treatment. You know, when you write that RX, it was to beat the devil out of them. I mean, <laughs> it just proceeded, you know, uh, to get more torturous after that. And so. You know, you had a lot of, uh, you know, people uh, reacting to their condition. But, you know, it's not all bad. I mean, we have in the exhibition also, uh, you know, in Louisiana, I guess we were talking about uh, uh, Congo Square, the slaves during, uh, you know, French period didn't have to work on Sundays. So uh, they were able to 
Uh, and during the Spanish, they were able to buy their own uh, freedom. And so we have examples of people who purchased their own freedom and, and so forth. And we have the manumission papers. But, uh, so, uh, but it's amazing uh, the different ways that you can discuss race in Louisiana, especially when it hits so close to home. And my inclination is to, uh, is to make our exhibits as, you know, uh, make the experience as emotionally packed as it is, uh, you know, informationally packed. So I, wanna, I want you to have a, like with all art and with all cultural e exhibits, you're trying to create uh, an, a, um, an experience between the visitor or the viewer and the object. And so, you know, I tell my staff that we want to create the maximum amount of experience and interaction with our exhibits. And so, you know, if that, if, 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 if this is our issue, then we have a lot of moral issues. Uh, and so, I don't know. How many of you think that we should go with uh, uh, something like the thing that I propose? How many of you think that would be something that uh, the museum should mount? Okay. I think you should have said it was going to happen. So I think you should have said no if you could actually make it happen. Oh, we could do it. But I mean, like ethical issues later without getting sued or something about something. No, I mean people. Yeah, I mean we wouldn't do it to people who would, uh, who were not of age, or you know we wouldn't do kids. I mean kids came through with a thing. Uh, so you'd have to be an adult. You'd have to sign a release. Uh, you'd have to, and you know always you can. We can even ask people to pay some part for it. I mean there are ways that you could do it to where the uh, those results wouldn't be a problem. But or are you talking about maybe uh, ancillary uh, suits from family members or something yeah. like that? Yeah. Oh, okay. So well. He's going to be a lawyer. <laughs> that's, that's what my lawyer, my boy, might say, something like what you just said. But, um, but you know, uh, but I think that, uh, the, uh, that the legal issues aside, the real decision that you make there is similar to the decision that, that you have to make when you lift that, you know, when you lift that piece of felt up over the photograph. Choice really isn't ours, it's the viewers. Should we put people in that position? We did a similar thing. Um, uh, we had an exhibit of uh, uh, Egyptian, you know, Egyptian funeral exhibits uh, at Noma. I don't know if you all saw that. It's, I guess it was about eight or nine years ago. Mm -hmm. Now, if you know, when you walked in, we had a sarcophagus there, which you know everybody to see that. But then, we actually had a mummy there, and we had it there exposed uh, so that you could actually see it. So the real question was for us at the museum, should that be presented so that everybody could see it? How many of you think that, that that's the decision we made? <laughs> should everybody see a mummy? No. You know, I mean, this is like a real mummy. I mean, it's not like you're seeing a picture of it or whatever. It's right there. It's under a piece of glass. Naked. How many of you think that that's the decision we made? I, I hope that was a decision you made. How many of you think that's a decision we should have made? How many of you think that we should have given the viewer the choice of whether they wanted to see it or not? Well, they have a choice whether they want to go there or not. Okay, so they're there, but they don't know what they're going to see. You turn around a corner and, uh, you know, a guy sticking a, a Q-tip in your mouth. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> we're not going to do it like that. Yeah, that's probably not a good idea. <laughs> that's the other, I guess, yeah. the uh, I think y'all did advertise that you would have an actual mummy there. That's right. So that, you know, people knew that they were going to see a mummy if they went in there. Well, I mean, a lot of people forget what they read So a lot of people came that didn't see that, though. But so, you know, there are people who didn't think that we needed the mummy. The mummy wasn't the one that came from that uh, tomb, that pyramid or whatever. So why are we putting it in there? Why do you think we put the mummy in there? To give people the option if they wanted it. 
He's cheering you all are so nice. <laughs> <laughs> to show what mummification is and how it pr can preserve it. Right. Uh -huh. And also, I mean, the fact of the matter is, you know, it also would increase <laughs> probably attendance too. People, <laughs> you come to the Egyptian show talking about mummies, everybody wants to know you got a mummy. So we did have the mummy there, but again, we gave people a choice. We had it behind the wall and a big sign that says, there's a naked mummy here. It's like 3,000 years old. Its skin is leathery. Its face is, you know, the skin is pulled all back. This could be, you know, a very emotional experience for some people. And so we had the big sign there. What do you think the response was? How many people think that that was one of the more popular parts of this exhibition? How many of you think that most people chose not to view it? There you go. So <laughs> I think that the decision that we make, whether we do it or not, almost foretells what the response will be. Because if you give people the option, that kind of absolves us of kind of a, shall we say, uh, just a philosophical, for sake of arguments, purposes, kind of gives us uh, a, an excuse. But the fact of the matter is by putting the decision before people, they may take advantage of it. So uh, what could be the consequences? What could be the consequences of exposing people's racial makeup? Oh, I see them as all being positive. I think if they might further investigate their history and things they might have thought were true, they might have to question. I think it's a good thing. And also, I look at it as part of history. Mm -hmm. And you were talking about this woman and the photograph in Vietnam. And um, even though she didn't want people to see her own body, I mean, it is, it is a record. It is history. And I think it's something that we all should be able to, to, to learn about. Yeah. What, what other reactions? What do you think? They might treat each other differently if they realize they have different ethnic makeup and they once believed or something. Or they just see that race is mute in general, but it's a mute point. Yeah. But it, it, if they see, you said that people may treat each other different if they see what? They have a different makeup. That that they, they have a different they, makeup. And they themselves. Which brings us kind of to what the real issue is for us. I mean, uh, the question is. I think that a lot of this discourse about race, the so-called discourse that we were supposed to have after the storm, it doesn't really affect real people. You know, they talk about things in generalities, they talk about things in statistics, they talk about everything but race. They talk about the descriptors of race. You know, the whole discussion after the storm, it wasn't really about race at all. It was really about poverty and uh, the fact that, you know, poverty and class. And, but, you know, kind of the uh, underlying thing about all this was that all of those people who were in that Superdome and who were in the, uh, you know, uh, the convention center were perceived to be what? Poor. Poor and, and black. No. Whether they were or not, we all know that that was not the case for people. There were all kinds of people in there, but that was the perception. And so race kind of, uh, you know, uh, factored into it. So my thing is that I think that we don't really, you, you know, you take this class. I mean, I don't think that we really have to uh, confront race on a personal level too often in our society, although it's like this thing that's like a current that flows underneath everything. But so, um, you know, uh, if we have a real discussion, why don't we make it personal? I mean, uh, that, I mean, that's where I think our real decision point is. Do we make it personal or do we do, you know, I could do, I could tell you 30 different historical topics and you know I have all kinds of people that we can talk about from Tremay uh, that could get into this kind of a whole thing. I mean, everybody's from Tremay, I mean, uh, that uh, is very significant. I mean, so um, I just wonder if, um, you know, uh, our 
institution is the right one to create a personal experience for our visitors with race. Because if you're there and I ask you, we ask you that question, you have to make a decision. And, and with all the votes that we've had here, we all think that most people would do the uh, controversial thing. Do you still feel that, that way? Yes, ma'am? I would do it, but I know my mother would kill me, like, in the process, but I would still do it. Just because I know my family's lying about some stuff, uh -huh. you know, as, as far as, you know, what my great, where my great-grandfather is from and so forth. So, you know, I think my, my family would be really against it just because it would seem disrespectful to then call my, gran my great-grandfather my grandfather liars, even though they, they did kind of uh -huh. fudge, fudge it, but, I mean, I would still want to know. You know, uh, if we did this, this would be part of just a much bigger thing because obviously what we would want to do after that or around that would be to show the, uh, you know, this whole cultural gumbo that we have here uh, in New Orleans. And so we would be able to show what has come of all of this, you know, uh, intermixing of cultures. So, and that would be easy to do. I mean, we, just, we could just take music, we could take food, we could take all these things and we could show where all these things come from. We could take this uh, particular database and uh, we can almost determine where uh, various types of rhythms for that music, not just say, we can just say generically that African rhythms came from, you know, that the slaves brought African rhythms, but if I knew what your DNA, what tribe, which they can do, place your tribe there, or whether, it, it, you know, even if you're European, like if you're Scottish or Irish or whatever, we could say what your, you know, cultural makeup was, what type of music uh, uh, your ancestors would have listened to in, in Ireland, uh, what type of food you would have eaten, how bringing that food and that music and that dance to New Orleans helped contribute to all this. But it all starts with you having to make that decision. And the real question is, is that, a, is that something that a museum should do? I like that. I like that question because I don't know. Uh, would they do it here at this university? Oh, absolutely not. <laughs> what do you think? I mean, you all are supposed to be the bastions for, you know, for intellectual, uh, Is you that know, a question discourse. For before Tim Ryan was <laughs> yeah, really. because it might be different now. Yeah, I mean, uh, suppose uh, you know when you walked in this class, I said. I want to give you a choice. You can stay for this lecture, but you have to submit to this thing, this DNA testing, or you can leave. If you leave, you don't, you know, get a good grade. When you make it a, a, a requirement versus an option, people are going to walk away. Right. But when you make it, here's what we're offering you. Do you know who you are? Do you know where you come from? Can you tell me what ethnicity your great 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 grandfather was you know because not only does New Orleans have this fabulous gumbo of s s past slaves and whatever we also have s probably one of the larger percentages of slaves that came from Haiti and from you know the, a that's lot right. of those Haitians after the revolution brought a lot of slaves with them and so that's where you had a lot of Creoles or lighter skinned blacks who held slaves. So a lot of the mix comes from who knows where and you may not know. You know, we've been talking about kind of the African kind of origins of all this stuff because that's what we do. But, you know, the fact of the matter is most of you all are, are white in this class. So if we squab you all, you know, you probably wouldn't get much about Africans here. But uh, so you all don't have to worry about that. But, uh, right? For the most part, right? Yeah, but how many how many but, whites know exactly what they are? But let's say, but let's say you find out that you're Irish or whatever. You know, the Irish didn't fare too well here in New Orleans for a very long time either, right? And suppose, you know, um, suppose you were Italian. Whatever. That, I mean, Italians didn't fare too well. I have a friend who was in an argument at a big commission, uh, Senate uh, commission on jazz or whatever, and that. Italians were arguing with the blacks about the origins of jazz and this guy who's a poet said uh, 
you know, it's uh, and it's ironic that you're, you know, defending, uh, trying to create this uh, white origins of jazz when y'all Italians just got to be white, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, uh, they weren't even considered to be fully white at the, uh, I mean, that's an extreme, you know, position, but it kind of, um, broke the ice uh, for that discussion. But the fact of the matter is, is that all of the, you know, all of the information about our cultural makeup, not just these kind of general generalities that we all talk about right now that we're comfortable with. We're all comfortable with, with them here. I mean, even the Africans here, they're comfortable with their Africanness. As a matter of fact, they want to be more African than they really are. You know, uh, the, uh, the people of Creoles want to be more, you know, French or Spanish or whatever or, or African than they really are. But, you know, wouldn't it be great if after 200 years of, you know, developing this gumbo, uh, we had an experiment, a public experiment where you could make a decision as to just how much you want to know about that background. Um, and these are the decisions that, uh, that we wrestle with uh, at museums. I mean, whether it be, uh, you know, the decision about a mummy. By the way, that mummy came from Tulane. <laughs> it wasn't from Egypt or anywhere. They, we were like looking all over uh, all these museums, looking for mummies that we could bring for the show and all this stuff. And uh, there was this mummy uh, that uh, we discovered. And it was in like, I think literally, uh, it was being stored in a dorm room at Tulane. <laughs> They, uh, <laughs> it was donated to them, and uh, they had to keep it kind of in this environmentally, you know, controlled place. And so they kind of, um, you know, uh, 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 created these conditions in, I think, a dorm room. It was, at least it was in a dorm building. But in any case, uh, I, um, I just want to, you know, just kind of... Uh, kind of to, to bring to you kind of the real life decisions that we have to deal with uh, when we approach, you know, how we present, uh, you know, really controversial issues. Um, I think that we can do an excellent uh, exhibition that could uh, go as, you know, as personal as we want to. But the real question is, will we? And what would be the response? Well, I like to vote in this class. And if we do, I hope that you all will come uh, visit the museum and see. Well, uh, do you have any questions, further questions for me? Because uh, I think our time is about to uh, expire. This is exhibit that you're, you're planning. I mean, is it really on the table, and are you really going to do it? Well, an exhibit is on the table, and of course, uh, like I said, we have, uh, you know, different components of it that are, you know, not controversial at all, that, that we certainly want to do. Uh, so, uh, but that is one that, um, you know, it's, um, I wouldn't say that it's uh, on the fence 50-50. I would say <clears throat> that it's probably... 25% uh, percent that we probably would and 75% percent that we won't. Is it a matter of funding? Or is it, um, is, is it the policy of it? I think it's all of that. Um, but you know, the interesting thing is you can get funds for controversial oh, things. Like so, make your money. <laughs> you know, if I, if I take this out of the mix, it's a lot harder to get this show funded. Because, I mean, it's like a regular kind of survey of New Orleans culture. You know, I got music, I got, you know, uh, crafts people, I got, you know, um, everybody. I got Homer Plessy. All these people lived in New Orleans. That kind of stuff, everybody's like oh, yawning. So, yes, ma'am. Well, I was going to say, to make it more realistic, instead of doing a DNA testing, you could offer, like, records, like a computer where, like, people could go and just search, kind of like family heritage so more, instead of like the scientific part, so it's kind of like more records, and I yeah. feel like that would be more realistic. Kind of like at Ellis Island, you can go That's look right. at your immigrants, you know. 
That, like that. that is one option too. And uh, that will be to kind of to put us in touch online with a uh, genealogical source. We certainly can do that with workshops. And to an extent, we can do a bit of that uh, by having, um, you know, terminals that could, you know, uh, get you started on something like that. Yep. How much of the villa is restored completely already? The villa is totally restored. Uh, it's a matter of uh, buildings. We have uh, uh, seven buildings, and um, we have a major, major grant that's working its way through. We may soon have an additional $3 million to finish uh, the other two buildings that we need to do and to do some deferred maintenance on those. So the villa uh, is completely restored. And we use it to, um, uh, the Drape Dominion show, the historical exhibits are in there. We have a shotgun double that we have contemporary art uh, in. And right now we have an uh, exhibition on the work of an artist named Ted Ellis, who's very, very popular. Uh, and then we have a Creole cottage that we have. H how many of you are familiar with the murals that are painted on the columns under the overpass when you're passing through Tremaine? Yeah, the museum. Uh, did that as a public uh, uh, service kind of community art project. And in order to win a commission to paint uh, one of those columns and to get the money to do it, you had to submit a 16 by 20 uh, oil on canvas painting of those. So we have an exhibit of all those paintings in one of our galleries and, you know, a little uh, thing that can show you where to go get them. More questions? Well, I like the spirit of this class, and uh, um, you know, I uh, and I certainly hope that I won't disappoint you all, and that uh, we maybe at uh, you when you're uh, looking at the roster of events that are happening in 2012, you might see something really, really, really special at the New Orleans African American Museum. And I think that'll be very uh, revealing for our audience as well as for the city because. You know, race is a construct that we need to get beyond. And uh, it seems like we just ebb and flow with it. And we keep going forward and backward, forward and backward, and forward and backward because we're not making it uh, personal and we're not making it, you know, scientific or factual. And at, you know, its very core, I think, you know, uh, individual people need to make their own decisions about uh, how race affects just how they view themselves and the world around them. And that's one thing that I think our museum, as you said, could do, if not us who. Well, thank you. All right. <laughs>